Hello, my name is Deborah Callahan, and I'm an Associate Director working in the field team at NICE. I'm also the SRO for the Health Inequalities Programme here, and as such, I'm delighted to be able to welcome you all to join us. It's fantastic that so many people have come to discover more about how we're considering health inequalities in the work that we do at NICE and how we're aligning our programmes to meet the needs of the system. I'm thrilled to say that not only are we going to have presentations from NICE colleagues, but we're also joined by colleagues from NHS England and Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust. Please feel free to submit any questions that you have using the button on the, um, on the screen that you can see. Um, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible during the panel discussion at the end. Without further ado, I would now like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Sam Roberts, NICE's Chief Executive. Welcome to the stage, Sam. Those who have joined us today. Um, health inequalities is one of those things that's been um, kind of central to the considerations of NICE since we were formed about 22 years ago. And so I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about how we thought about it in the past and how we're thinking about it in the future. So in terms of um, NICE's overall role, I think as we all know, it's to get the best care to patients fast that's good value for our taxes. And we do this through independent, transparent, rigorous assessments of new technologies or pathways through things like clinical guidelines or appraisal of medicines. And for many, many years, we've considered the impact on health inequalities as really central to those assessments. So many of you will know with all of our assessments, with all of our guidelines, we're always thinking about what's the impact on health inequalities? Does this widen them? Does this um, address certain health inequalities? And that's a key part of all of our committee's considerations. Um, so we're proud of NICE's history in this area. Having said that, I don't think any of us have ever lived through a time like now in a health system. You know, we're coming through the impact of um, or living through the impact of COVID, which has kind of raised and raised and raised and continues to raise the profile of how, what an important issue this is. And we're also um, living through this wonderful golden age of innovation where we're seeing so many new technologies, um, so many um, different types of medicines, digital technologies, diagnostics coming to the fore. And it's really important that we think carefully about what the impact of those are on, on health inequalities. So what does that mean for us at NICE? Well, it means that we're both going to keep that kind of foundational consideration of health inequalities in absolutely everything we do. That's not gonna change ever. Um, but we need to build and amplify what we're doing. And you're gonna hear some of um, uh, the speakers today talking about what we're going to be building and amplifying. So every time in, in all areas of our work that we ask our stakeholders, what do you want us to do differently at NICE? You, we always hear the same three things. We want you to focus on what matters most, give us useful and useful advice, and be part of a system that constantly learns. So how that relates to health inequalities in terms of focusing on what matters most, well, health inequalities is one of those things. So it's where we woven through everything we do. But we're also trialing new tools that you'll hear about later today to try to um, understand the, the impact of different inequalities and their extent. So that's focused on what matters most. Useful and useful advice. We really thought long and hard about this um, with, with health inequalities because it's something that kind of cuts across everything we do. And sometimes it can be quite hard to extract from the nice advice. So, so what are you actually saying is going to help? And in order to answer that question, um, which was a challenge we got from our wonderful NHS England colleagues, was we created a health inequalities webpage where we've gone through all of our guidelines and we've really picked out the top hits on, you know, if I was an ICS, where would I really get started on health inequalities? So we're trying to provide more useful and useful advice for you on this really crucial issue. And then the last is being part of a system that constantly learns, where we completely know we don't have all the answers on this um, issue, but we're up for learning about it. And that's why we are so excited that we've got so many people on this call today because please give us comments, suggestions, improvements for um, some of the tools that you're going to be hearing about. And then our wonderful partners, because, you know, if it wasn't for folks like all at NHS England, um, you know, we, we wouldn't be as far along the journey as we are. So we're delighted that they've joined us today. And without further ado, I will hand over um, to those voices in the room so you can hear more. 
um, about the broader perspective. Thanks, Deb. Thank you so much, Sam. That was a, a great introduction. Um, I should have mentioned really that people can access the NICE Health Inequalities web pages via a button on the screen as well. So there's a, a link to be able to ask questions of the panel and there's also a link to the NICE web pages. Um, as Sam mentioned, we're, we're very keen to get any feedback on those web pages. So please do get in touch. I'd now like to welcome with great pleasure speaker, Dr. Bola Ovalavi who is the Director of Healthcare Inequalities at NHS England um, and we'd love to hear more from you Bola about the uh, priorities and ambitions of the, the health and care system. So over to you. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, what a pleasure um, to be able to, to join you today. Um, and thank you, Sam, um, for those really powerful um, opening remarks that you've just shared uh, with us. I really do want to thank you, um, Sam, Deb, and all our colleagues in NICE, uh, just for the humanity and the commitment uh, that you've brought to the conversations that led us um, here today. Just wanted to start by saying a huge thank you. Um, for those who have heard me state the vision many times, you will indulge me again, because I think the vision is important. Uh, it just really, I believe, focuses us um, in terms of that positive, powerful, positive, compelling future of the vision. And so the vision that we are gathered around today, all the thousand people on this call, just a staggering number to even say it, you know, the thousand people on this call and many, many more um, right across the country. The vision that we are gathered around is exceptional quality healthcare for all. And that we achieve that by being mindful of providing equitable access, that people have an excellent experience and that by doing all that, we can deliver optimal outcomes for everyone, regardless of where they happen to live, regardless of whether they have a learning disability or they don't, whether they have a severe mental illness or they don't, regardless of race, color or creed, regardless of their bank balance, that all of those things don't matter, that we do deliver that equitable access, that excellent experience, that optimal outcomes for all. That is the vision. But the other thing that I'm very mindful of is that in order for a vision to become reality, we do need three things. We need our heads, we need our hearts, and we need our hands. And this is where I really want to again salute Sam for your leadership, because the first conversation we had was a hearts conversation. It was a conversation about what we wanted to do together to help people, those that are voiceless or those whose voices are not heard enough. We had a heart conversation and then we broadened that out and Deb and Aoife came alongside us on a heart conversation on the art of what is possible. And when we started with our hearts, we were able to see possibilities. We were able to see opportunities we saw beyond the barriers. And then our heads got involved. We started talking about what are the practical things that we can now do together. And when the heads finished their work, look what the hands have delivered. This amazing portal and all the brilliant tools that colleagues are going to be sharing with us today. And I just want to salute this work as a perfect example of when leadership starts with the heart, the head follows and the hand delivers. It delivers what matters to people. It delivers what will make a real difference in people's lives. And I just want to say thank you again for that. And I'm just going to conclude by saying, this is an all hearts endeavor. It's NHS England. 
It's NICE. It's our local authority partners. It's our colleagues in the pharmaceutical industry, the life sciences. It's our voluntary sector partners. It's our people and our communities. This task of narrowing the health inequalities gap, it's an all hearts agenda. And I'm so pleased that so many of you have taken the trouble to join us today. And because you have, and the dedication and commitment that brought you here, I am convinced that we will together deliver on those priorities that we've set out, that we will restore our NHS services inclusively, all our services inclusively, that we will mitigate against digital exclusion, that we will make sure that the data is complete so that we can see where our gaps are, that we will absolutely move forward on those preventative actions and not just pick people up once they've already fallen downstream, and that we will strengthen leadership and accountability because that is the thing that keeps us going in the right direction. Thank you all for all that you're doing and all that you will continue to do in this space. Thank you. Back to you, Deb. Thank you, Berla. That was so motivational. And you talk about hearts and mind is racing. Um, we've just enjoyed working with you so much and we really look forward to the continued relationship with yourselves and also, of course, with the wider community that have joined the call today. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce ourselves, one of the heads, the great minds, Leslie Owen. Um, Dr. Leslie Owen uh, is a, a technical advisor at NICE and she has been leading the methods and processes work. So um, thinking through how we can strengthen our consideration of equalities and health inequalities in guideline development. And Leslie, over to you. We're looking forward to hearing more about it. Thank you, Deb. I'm just hoping this click is going to work and at some point a slide's going to appear. Um, I'll try again. There we are. We can I see your slides you now. Go. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so in this session, I'm going to provide an overview of our approach to strengthening consideration of health inequalities in guideline development. And I think it's really important to start with what we mean by health inequalities because we hear people talking about very different concepts. And I think to be able to progress this work, we need to be on the same page and have a shared understanding of what we mean by health inequalities. I'll then go on to describe the stages of guideline development because each stage represents an opportunity to strengthen our approach. And then I'll go on to say a little bit about the projects that have informed our approach and what we're doing to do things differently. So what do we mean by health inequalities? Health inequalities are systematic, unfair and avoidable differences in health across the population and between different groups within society. The health inequalities arise because of the condition in which we are born, grow, live, work and age. And these conditions influence our opportunities for good mental and physical health. So in this slide, on the left hand side, the blue column, you can see the stages in guideline development. On the right hand side, in the paler blue boxes, I hope you can see them, you can see the points in the process where we seek input from external stakeholders. And this includes opportunities for organisations representing patient groups to input, as well as input from other groups, including those with lived experience. So moving back to the first column, once a topic's been identified for development, a scope's prepared, which sets the boundary for what the guideline will and won't cover. We have to cut our cloth. We have to deliver things within the resources we have available. So it identifies what the guideline will and won't cover. It identifies the population groups, the interventions and the settings that would be will be considered and it sets in train the evidence reviews that will be presented to the committees that they will then use for developing the draft guideline and recommendations. That draft guideline then goes out to consultation to 
external stakeholders. Their comments are fed back to the committee who then revise the guideline in light of those comments. Once we have a revised guideline, it is then assessed, quality assessed by a team independent of the development process to make sure that NICE's processes and methods have been followed in the development of the guideline and in the development of the evidence reviews. It then goes to executive directors at NICE for sign off and the guidance is published. We then have a surveillance process in place, which is carried out by a team who will be constantly looking at new evidence to see whether it potentially impacts the recommendations that have been made. They will also look at changes in practice. They will consider changes in policy and changes in legislation in order to determine whether an update is needed. And then it will go back into this process again of development. So I think you can see there are, there are multiple opportunities here for us to strengthen our approach to health inequalities. So moving on to the approach that we took, we first established, and you would expect this of NICE, I think, we first established a cross-institute methods and processes group. And we agreed that the first action should be to a survey to map how health inequalities are currently considered within the Institute's work program. Other key areas of activities included a review of our current equality impact assessment process, methods to incorporate health inequalities in health cost effectiveness analyses, the use of real world data to provide an insight into the extent of health inequalities in accessing and implementing interventions recommended by NICE. And lastly, a raft of other projects to help inform the guideline development process, including the role of NICE's research recommendations in addressing gaps in evidence and health inequalities. So what are we going to do differently? Well, we're going to adopt a framework for starters and to pilot the prototype tool to help guide a systematic, transparent and robust consideration of health inequalities. We'll make more and better use of the equality impact assessment process. We've built in health inequalities and revised it to become an assessment of equalities and health inequalities. We've also developed a guideline support document to support this process to support developers and committees with that work. We are producing health inequalities briefings and these will produce, they will provide an overview of health inequality issues arising in relation to different topics. We've developed three so far covering weight management, type two diabetes and breast cancer. And again, as you might expect of NICE, we've developed an independent quality assurance process for these briefings because they're slightly different to our systematic reviews. We are in the process of developing resources to support training in health inequalities. So we run various lunch and learn sessions. We have slide sets, we have videos, but they've tended to focus really on basic training in health inequalities. And we know that we need to do more and we need to develop resources to support in-depth training of guideline developers and committee members. As we start to pilot these things and as they come to fruition, we're embedding those changes in the Centre for Guidelines and Methods Manual update. And we are exploring the potential to adopt and adapt this revised equality and health inequality assessment process for use in the Centre for Health Technology Evaluation. We are also piloting a prototype tool with past technology appraisals to identify any issues arising in using more quantitative methods for considering health inequalities. And we're continuing our collaboration with the data analytics teams and other teams in NICE to address gaps in the evidence and to increase our understanding of the impact of health inequalities on health inequalities of NICE products. And we will monitor the impact of these um, developments to, to ensure that they are making a difference. And if we need to, we will tweak them.
So I've mentioned the framework a few times and it's absolutely fundamental to the work that we're doing for considering health inequalities. And the framework we're using to help map the landscape looks at health inequalities in two different ways. It looks at inequalities between who and inequalities of what. So on the first, inequalities between who, we're looking at four dimensions. So protected characteristics as defined in the 2010 Equalities Act and includes characteristics such as age, race and gender. We're looking at socioeconomic deprivation, which brings in some of the wider determinants around low income, education, housing. We're looking at geography, where people live. We know it makes a difference, whether it's urban, rural, coastal, whether it's built up, whether there's green space, these are really important considerations. We're also looking at inclusion groups, including traveling traveler communities, people with lived experience of homelessness and offender populations. Um, in terms of inequalities of what, we're looking at five domains here. So we're looking at health status, so that includes things like life expectancy. We're looking at behavioural risk to health, so that would include things like smoking, lack of physical activity. With the wider determinants, we'd be looking at things like housing and unemployment. Um, with access to care, we're looking at the availability of treatments, the accessibility of treatments. And with quality and experience of care, we, we would be looking at things like levels of patient satisfaction. So that's um, quite a big ask really in terms of everything that we're trying to do. I realise that and we've been working very closely with different teams in deciding which framework to adopt for this work. So moving on to the prototype health inequalities impact tool. It was commissioned by NICE and developed by economists at the University of York and it was developed to support NICE committees to consider the potential impact on health inequalities of interventions they're thinking of recommending. And for the health effects you can see we, we've got a stepped approach here and these represent the inputs on the tool and they very much mirror the framework that I've just been describing in that it talks about populations, differentials in uptake and differentials in health effects and so on. Um, for the health effect, it uses outputs from economic analyses and these are combined with deprivation data on the eligible, the population that are eligible for the intervention, the uptake of that intervention, I've already mentioned the health effects and the opportunity costs of spending money on one thing rather than something else. Um, and this is something that we've actually used in three different guideline committee meetings now. And we found it immensely useful in terms of facilitating a systematic discussion about health inequalities given the topic in hand. So it, it does seem to be fitting the bill in these very early stages of piloting. And moving on to my last slide, I'm sorry, it's a bit, it's a bit busy and I'm not expecting you to be able to read the detail, but I've included it because it's intended to show how the different outputs from the methods projects feeds in to the guideline development process and beyond. So the dark blue box, boxes along the bottom are all the products that we've been producing as outputs as a result of the methods and processes work. And as you can see from the kind of double ended arrows, these outputs feed into multiple stages in the guideline development process. So it really does help to show, I think, or highlight the opportunities that we have at NICE to increase the focus on health inequalities in our work. And I'd like to thank you for listening. And as Deb said, um, we can take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. I think the busyness of that last slide reflects the busyness of your work programme. You described so much. <laughs> it was a really good detailed overview of uh, the nice approach to considering equalities and health inequalities.
Um, and it was a good reminder as well uh, to our audience, uh, please do remember to keep posting questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can, but even if we can't get through your questions, we do appreciate them and um, any comments or feedback is very much appreciated too. I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, uh, Joe McCormack, who is an implementation facilitator based in the field team, uh, specifically in the Midlands and East of England. Um, Joe's going to talk to us a little bit about how NICE guidance can be used to support the system to address health inequalities. Over to you, Joe. That's lovely. Thank you, Deb. Hello, everyone. In this next session, I will be talking about how NICE guidance can help you reduce the health inequalities gap. Tackling health inequalities is in NICE's DNA. This is reflected both in our core principles, which set out a long-standing commitment to reducing health inequalities in our processes, and our five-year strategy, which outlines a renewed determination to focus our efforts on guidance topics that can help reduce health inequalities. Extensive stakeholder engagement told us that the health and care system looks to NICE for evidence-based approaches to address health inequalities. We're seen as a leader in evidence excellence and the public expect that consideration of health inequalities is done in a systematic, consistent and transparent manner. NICE guidance makes evidence-based recommendations on a wide range of topics. These range from recommendations on the use of innovative technologies, to preventing and managing specific conditions and planning broader services and interventions to improve the health of communities. One of our core principles is that guidance should support strategies that improve population health as a whole, while offering particular benefit to the most disadvantaged. In addition to the protected characteristics stated in the Equality Act 2010, we also take into account inequalities arriving from socio-economic factors and the circumstances of certain groups of people, such as looked after children and people experiencing homelessness. Our guidance aims to reduce and not increase identified health inequalities, and this may mean making recommendations for specific groups of people. If the health and care system implements NICE guidance equitably, it will ensure that the care provided is effective, makes efficient use of resources and reduces inequalities and unwarranted variation. An example of a guideline shown here is for diabetes in children and young people, diagnosis and management. And the recommendation is building on national clinical audit data highlighting poor access to or uptake of continuous glucose monitoring among some groups. For example, some ethnic minority groups and people living in more deprived areas, we make a recommendation that commissioners and providers should monitor who is using it, identify groups that are eligible but have low uptake, and then make plans to engage with these groups. Alongside our guidelines, we also publish quality standards. These are taken from our guidance and set out priority areas for quality improvement. Each quality standard includes a set of statements and quality measures. Nice quality standards can support a population health management approach by helping you to identify high impact interventions and areas of unwarranted variation whether that be access, experience or outcomes. And this is an example of one of our quality standards, flu vaccination, increasing uptake, a priority area for improvement in core 20 plus five that systems may choose to focus on. One of the statements is that providers use a range of different methods to invite people in eligible group for vaccinations. If you click on a statement in our quality standard, you will see additional information, including a rationale and quality measures, 
which can be useful for monitoring improvement over time, and information which in this case includes invitations for flu vaccinations are more effective when a range of different methods are used to suit people's needs. Initial invitations and reminders for over, overdue vaccinations can be in writing, a letter, email, text message, by phone or social media, during face-to-face -face interactions if the opportunity arises, or using a combination of methods to maximise vaccine uptake. The person's eligible group and any other demographic information should be taken into account when determining that most suitable type of invitation. And follow-up invitations in a different format to the initial invitation can help to prompt people who are eligible for vaccination but haven't taken up the offer. There's a definition of what we mean by a range of different methods and also a section on equality and diversity considerations shown here. And this is our health inequalities web pages. We've mapped NICE guidance and quality standards to common health inequalities frameworks, such as Le Bonte and Marmot, as well as the core 20 plus five approach. This slide gives examples of our guidance aligned to the Le Bonte model, with interventions focusing on treating place and not just people. You'll find the NICE guidance and quality standards on excess winter deaths and health risks of cold homes, and also guidance on vaccinations, for example. This slide gives examples of our guidance aligned to the intervention areas or principles outlined by Marmot, which recognises that disadvantage starts before birth and accumulates throughout life. You'll find nice guidance on pregnancy and complex social factors, care and support of people growing older with learning disabilities, community engagement, as well as our comprehensive tobacco guideline. And for Core 20 plus 5, we've mapped the key NICE guidelines, quality standards, tools and resources aligned to those five clinical areas of focus and the cross-cutting theme of smoking cessation, providing some useful case studies. Within the Health Inequalities web resource, we've also included mapping on general approaches to addressing health inequalities. Here you'll find our quality standard with statements on promoting health and preventing premature mortality in black, Asian and other minority ethnic groups. Guidelines on community engagement with recommendations to help design and support delivery of accessible health and wellbeing programmes. Behaviour change and shared decision making. Our shared decision-making guideline covers how to make shared decision-making part of everyday care and includes recommendations on training, communicating risks, benefits and consequences, using decision aids and how to embed shared decision-making in organisational culture and practices. Shared decision-making mitigates, mitigates against the impact of poor health literacy by taking the time to break things down for people, including those who don't necessarily have English as their first language, improves communication and has a greater impact on those who are more disadvantaged. Providing useful and usable advice is what's important to us. And you'll find everything I've discussed in this new online web resource at this web address. There's our recommended, evidenced approaches to address health inequalities, how NICE products can support systems with tackling current priorities, including Core 20 plus 5, our guidance collated and aligned to recognised health inequality frameworks, including Le Bonte and Marmot, accessible and in one place on the NICE website. 
If you'd like to know more or get help with implementing our guidance, please contact the field team at NICE. We work regionally across England, Wales and Northern Ireland with health and social care organisations, networks and systems to help put our guidance into practice, encouraging, informing and facilitating implementation activities. That was a fantastic overview and I think we're probably uh, blessed by being able to see the, the face behind the voice of the Core 20 plus 5 presentation that's about to, do, about to go live on the NICE Health Inequalities pages because you've recorded a, a short presentation on the key NICE guidance and quality standards aligned to the Core 20 plus 5, haven't you? And uh, that will be available on the NICE web pages soon so everybody can see what you look like. Um, I would just like to remind everybody that you can access the web pages through the link um, just below the screen. So please do that and keep your comments coming through. And I'm now delighted to welcome Jane Bethia and Sally Ann Summers, Rottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust, who are going to talk to us uh, about their experience of using NICE guidance to help address um, health inequalities experienced by some of society's most vulnerable people. So over to you both. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And we will try and keep as squeezed together as possible so everybody can see us. So thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, I'm Jane Bethay. I'm a consultant in public health from Knotts Healthcare Trust and I'm here with my colleague Sayan Summers who's a service manager here and we're going to be talking about how we've used NICE guidelines particularly in relation to substance misuse and mental health so coexisting substance misuse and mental health uh, which is a, a huge issue in terms of health inequality and vulnerability. So although we are presenting this today, it's really important that we note the input across our integrated care system here. This is a system wide piece of work that we're presenting um, and part of a much larger strategic partnership. OK, so I won't dwell on this too much, but we're going to talk a little bit about context to begin with and about health inequality and how that's relevant to what we're talking about today. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the NICE guideline and some, pull out a couple of areas that we're going to focus on. And then Sally Ann is going to talk about how we've turned that into the beginnings of a, of a clinical pathway that we're building on as a system to try and get to the best possible position for this vulnerable cohort. OK, so um, very quickly then, just to focus on inequality, that's the huge focus of what we're talking about today. So this particular group that we're talking about is very vulnerable. So these are individuals who've got a significant mental health problem, but also have a significant coexisting substance misuse issue. So for some people on this call, you may be familiar with the term dual diagnosis. This is kind of in the old money what this was, was termed as, um, and now we say coexisting substance misuse and mental health. So this is an issue that is, is complex, but not rare. So if we think about how many people we're likely to see with this issue, it's not a rare problem. So, for example, we know that within um, community mental health teams, some research has suggested that's as high as like 45 percent of people in those that are seen. In those teams, five percent of people in substance misuse services have a significant mental health issue in the last year. So it's not a small issue. In terms of inequality of outcome, so unsurprisingly, perhaps this is linked with reduced life expectancy. So lots of people on this call will already be aware that having a serious mental illness reduces your life expectancy significantly. It's about 20 years. For Nottingham in men, it's about 17 years compared to the general population, so enormous. But research also shows us that having a significant substance misuse issue also reduces your life expectancy by about the same amount. So if you think about those th two things together, we're facing really significant inequality uh, in relation to that. People who experience SMI or severe mental illness and also substance Issues are more likely to live in deprived areas. There's also this potential issue for diagnostic overshadowing. So this means about what if you present with a, a particular issue, for example, serious mental illness or substance misuse, sometimes that becomes your main presenting condition and it overshadows other parts of your health. And for example, can mean you don't get as many opportunities for preventative care. And then the final thing is about um, accessibility, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Other things that we uh, need to recognise is that even with substance misuse and mental health, that's complex, but this is often part of a much more complex picture. And what we mean by that is that 
people who experience this, these coexisting issues are much more likely than the general population to experience homelessness, to experience things like offending. So it actually it compounds the risk for this very vulnerable group. And then we also know that there's evidence to suggest there's an increased risk of suicide in this group. In terms of access, this is really important. This is a really important to consider. So inequality in terms of access for this group is about exclusion. So the NICE guideline for this talks very, very um, clearly about we must not exclude people with a significant substance misuse issue from mental health services. Historically, this has been an issue, both you know, nationally, but also lots of teams will report that, that there's been some issues to do with exclusion. But the other thing that we need to consider is that people have a, a real potential for, to fall through the gaps and to fall into the through, through the cracks of services who've got this particular experience. So if we think about how services are commissioned and provided, you've got substance misuse services that are local authority setting and often provided by third sector organisations. And then you have what um, mental health services provided by a range of organisations, but largely in a secondary care setting like this, by large NHS organisations, and they are commissioned by what was the CCG, which is turning obviously into the ICB model. So they are two very different ways that services are provided and the way that they're, they're commissioned. And that's very relevant when you look at the things we're trying to achieve. Okay, so um, the guideline that we're going to talk about today is snappily known as NG58. Um, this is one of a number of guidelines that are around coexisting substance misuse and mental health. But really, this has allowed us to look at benchmarking where we were as a system and where we want to be, identify gaps and be that starting point for us about where we want to want to get to. There's a raft of recommendations that come through this guideline and we don't have time to talk about them all today. But just to focus on a couple of areas. So you'll see from, you'll see from this guideline, there's some really important points that sound very simple, but are actually very difficult to enact. One of them is about, this is everybody's job. This is about working together, working flexibly, working in an integrated way to provide person-centered care. So it's about commissioners and providers in different sectors coming together to do the right thing. That's a challenge when you have systems that are commissioned in a way that actually promotes fragmentation quite a lot of the time. And also this idea of no wrong door. This is really pivotal to us here in Nottinghamshire. So this is about if I turned up in our substance misuse service in Nottingham City, is that service able to respond to my mental health needs appropriately as well as my substance misuse needs? And the same if I turned into it, turned up at a local mental health team in Nottingham, are the people working with me there able to respond to my substance misuse needs and understand the sort of need that I have. And these are very, very complex things to, to change. There's some cultural issues to change, but also it's about integration and working together. So just before I hand over to Sally, I'm going to talk about how we're operationalizing this. This, in a very quick nutshell, is what we're doing in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. So this is about bringing together substance misuse services across the city and the county, two different providers, with inpatient mental health with local mental health teams but having a, that all of that bridged by the right workers in the right place and bringing in lived experience through peer support to try and give people the confidence and, and the bravery sometimes to take that next step into recovery. So I'm just going to hand over to sally Ann. Okay so in terms of what we were trying to do uh, we were looking at improving the quality of treatment for people with coexisting substance misuse so like Jane's been saying that we wanted to improve the quality of wherever anyone presented, that they could, we could look at the person as a whole. Um, improved access, reduced waiting times for mental health treatment. That was obviously, um, often a barrier in Nottingham where people felt that they were waiting for a long time or they'd be assessed more than once or they wouldn't meet thresholds. So that was a big thing that we wanted to look at. We wanted to improve substance misuse support provided in mental health services. Um, we wanted to upskill the workforce so that we could look at trying to meet those needs of thinking about this, this is everybody's job. Um, in terms of no wrong door, we wanted to help people navigate through the services, which can often be really difficult. Um, and we've set this up um, very importantly as collaborative working across services. So rather than the trust set up a standalone service, what we decided to do was to um, share that money and have a service which is uh, provided with substance misuse services, the trust and voluntary sector working together. 
So I just wanted to say a little bit about what we're doing in practice. So within the local mental health team settings, we have substance misuse workers that are now working in reaching into these into the mental health teams. They're helping to identify substance misuse um, problems. They're able to provide specialist assessments of the complex needs. They can develop effective care plans. They can work uh, jointly with the mental health teams, um, providing treatment, short-term treatment for this population. Uh, we do brief interventions. Um, we can act as a resource so we can let the mental health team workers know all about what's on offer out there because there's lots. Um, and then we're trying to provide substance misuse training um, and supervision so that um, all of the workers get to understand how to work with people with coexisting mental health and substance misuse. Um, where these workers that we have uh, provide brief interventions where somebody needs to come into um, full substance misuse treatment, then we have um, the peer supports that I'll come on to uh, helping to navigate and get these people into substance misuse services. On the flip side of that, so what are we doing within the substance misuse service settings? We have um, very experienced mental health workers that are in reaching into those services. So they're providing very, um, very fast actually mental health assessments uh, for people within substance misuse settings. So the access is uh, much improved. Workers can speak to the, um, speak to the mental health um, staff and ask for advice and information on how to manage things. They can provide formulation, care plans, um, they provide mental health support and interventions. Where somebody needs to come into mental health services, they act as a trusted assessor. So if they've done that assessment within substance misuse services, uh, rather than somebody having to retell their story, they can come straight into treatment in um, mental health which is obviously managing a big barrier. Um, and they're also providing training um, and brief interventions. So within the inpatient settings, um, we also have mental uh, substance misuse workers that are in reaching and providing uh, support onto the wards. So they will be identifying substance misuse, um, advising, they will be talking about bloodborne viruses. They will be advising in terms of any treatment that, that needs to happen. They'll be in, involved in discharge planning. Um, they'll also provide intensive support when somebody leaves hospital and they're providing training and groups on the wards. We also have um, a pilot up in um, Midnot, Midnottinghamshire uh, where we have peer support workers attached to this pathway. So they're enabling sort of cross-working between substance misuse and mental health, where somebody needs to um, access services, they're helping with that access, and they're providing um, support and working alongside somebody in their recovery journey. Um, so we're evaluating that at the moment, um, which Jane will talk about in a minute. So where are we, where are we at the moment? What's our next step? So we're, we're trying to bring together the, um, some of the services that we have. We have a homelessness service, mental health team, and we're trying to um, increase the, improve the links between that service and the mental health teams and with street outreach. Okay. okay, and ju just finally, just to, to finish off, is that the other thing that we, we, we going back to a health inequalities perspective, is that we're making sure we've got a life course approach. So we're making sure that we're looking at young people and older adults. For older adults, there's some hidden issues around coexisting substance misuse and mental health. We know that. And so we're trying to address that as well. The other thing that we're doing is, is we are evaluating everything we do and doing needs assessment for everything that we do as well. And we're doing all of that through a lens of of, of that protective characteristics that we discussed earlier this afternoon. So we want to make sure that everything that we do, all of our pathways, all of this work, as well as being benchmarked against those nice guidelines, also takes into account equity of access for people from our diverse communities, for women, for people with a range of different characteristics, and that we can look at equity of outcome 
for those individuals as well. So we've invested in um, a number of evaluations, health, health needs assessment, and we've linked in, and I'm sure our nice colleagues will be pleased to hear our evidence-based approach. We've linked in with um, some national research that's around what looks, what does good really look like? For, for, for dual diagnosis or coexisting substance misuse and mental health. And we're learning from, from that research and running a workshop in December to plan forward for what does absolutely best look like for our citizens here in, in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. Um, just to end, this is our contact details. Um, so sally and I are always happy to discuss this more with anybody who's interested, uh, but we hope that we've given an example of how benchmarking against guidelines and then using your networks and your system working locally can actually bring that to life to improve outcomes for really vulnerable people. Thank you so much, Jane and sally Ann. That was a fantastic presentation and it's generated lots of interest. We've got lots of really positive comments um, from the audience. So we really appreciate you joining us and we're glad that you can stay for the panel discussion as there are a couple of questions for you. In the meantime, I'm now going to welcome Dr. Aoife Malloy, um, who's a senior clinical advisor with the National Healthcare Inequalities Improvement Programme at NHS England. And Aoife, you're going to be talking a little bit about how NICE and NHS England are collaborating to support the system to address health inequalities. So over to you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, delighted to be here. I'm a consultant in infectious diseases and general medicine. Um, and so, you know, really tackling healthcare inequalities in business as usual in healthcare is really my bread and butter. And I'm a huge fan of NICE and putting evidence into practice. So I'm really excited about this collaboration um, where we're using all the suite of NICE guidance and evidence and resources to underpin the work of the National Healthcare Inequalities Team Team supporting ICSs to address healthcare inequalities. Um, and you heard Dr. Bola Owalabi talking us through the vision of the health inequalities team. And I was, I'm kind of, since the NICE website on health inequalities has been released, I've been pouring over it and tweeting about it continuously. Um, and what really struck me is that the, um, the essence of the NICE resources ta to tackle healthcare inequalities um, and the, the aims, you know, to put the evidence into practice, to make sure everything is effective and consistent and makes the best use of resources really underpins the vision of our program and um, so so you know what we're really trying to get at is co excellent quality health care for all and um, so we're trying to reach that elusive gold standard of nice guidance for all people um, and we we want to really fight the bell curve we don't accept that there are um, people who should have worse outcomes because of their circumstances or their ethnicity or their race or their um, level of deprivation um, and so using the nice resources we're really hoping to get equitable access excellent experience and optimal outcomes um, so, so I think the, 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 the beauty of the collaboration between NICE and NHS England uh, Healthcare Inequalities Improvement Programme is that we've got these really robust evidence-based strategies and processes to underpin the, the implementation that we are trying to to promote in NHS England. And, and we have developed the, the Health Inequalities Improvement Planning Matrix. And so this is like a checklist, um, a holistic lens that all interventions in healthcare should be looked at through to make sure that we're address, addressing all the areas of healthcare inequalities. And I'm delighted to say that our Healthcare Inequalities Improvement Planning Matrix is underpinned with all the nice quality standards that relate to it. Um, and that really lends the rigor um, and the robust evidence to our, 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 our tool. And we're delighted with that. We would encourage uh, teams and ICBs to really use this uh, improvement planning matrix. And um, we heard some fabulous examples of ICS working and collaboration to support the improvement of healthcare inequalities, especially in inclusion health groups. Um, and I'm delighted to say we were recently working with the urgent and emergency care team in NHS England to really 
completely revamp our approach to addressing pe uh, people and their circumstances when they're experiencing homelessness in urgent and emergency care. Um, and we developed a pathway based on NICE guidance um, for all emergency units to use. And this was developed in collaboration with people with lived experience, with the third sector, um, and with authors of the NICE guidance, and with ICSs and acute trusts. Um, and I have to say it was really wonderful to see this evolve. So we started off with a very sort of um, auto automatic, almost autocratic approach to addressing uh, people's needs when they arrive in A&E. Um, and we ended up with this really holistic, supportive pathway that looked at comfort, dignity and putting evidence into practice, as well as signposting and collaborating across the whole of the ICS. Um, and I think this is a really good example of how nice evidence can underpin a very collaborative and patient-centred approach to addressing healthcare and qualities. So our support offer in the Core 20 plus 5 programme, which you've heard Dr. Bola Oalabi talk about, um, we are really accelerating the improvement of healthcare inequalities. Um, and we have a few flagship support offers that I will talk us through briefly. Um, so you can see here we have, um, uh, we're really big on data and using data to inspire improvement, but not using data to slow us down. And I'm going to talk us through a few examples of how we're using the data we already have to really make the case and identify gaps and then drive the improvement. So um, I'd like to talk about our Core 20 Plus Ambassadors program. So we have recruited over 100 clinical and professional leaders across pretty much every single ICS in the country to help address healthcare inequalities. And these are people who are working really, really hard, who are really benevolent and who are addressing healthcare inequalities in and between their normal roles. So we've got healthcare scientists, we've got pharmacists, physiotherapists, we've got primary care practice managers, we've got social workers, we've got GPs, we've got professors of cardiology and directors of public health. We've got a wonderful multidisciplinary expert peer reference group. And we've agreed with Jo that she will train all these ambassadors in using the whole suite of nice resources to address healthcare inequalities in an evidence-based way. So I just think this is a fantastic pairing of energy and evidence and willpower. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to this uh, coming to fruition. The next uh, um, a support offer I'd like to talk about is the Core 20 Plus Collaborative. And this is a really exciting initiative that we're working with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the IHI in America on. Um, so what we have done is we've partnered with the IHI, who are really impressed with the, the energy and the drive to address healthcare inequalities in this country. And they're really committed, they're contributing resources, but they're also keen to get some learning from this. So what we are going to do is we're going to select seven ICSs, one per region, where we will um, intensively support the accelerated implementation of Core 20 plus 5. So we are at the moment calling for applications um, and um, towards the end of the month we'll be identifying the seven sites who we will work very closely with alongside IHI to really put into practice the essence of Core 20 plus 5. So these uh, sites will be given coaching, quality improvement skills, skills in storytelling, community involvement, community engagement, how to spread innovation. And then we're hoping to really rapidly gather the learning from them and then spread it out across all the rest of the country in the next phases of this work. And as I had on the slide, um, the, the curriculum for this work, we've agreed that that would be the NICE Health Inequalities Resources page. So once again, we're using the NICE Health Inequalities Resources as a manual on what to do at ICS level to address healthcare inequalities. Um, we've heard some fabulous examples of the importance of community involvement um, from Nottinghamshire and, um, and, and some of the stuff that Joe mentioned as well. Um, and I'd like to talk about our Connectors program. So we've funded um, community leaders across all ICSs across the whole country to really champion community-led 
improvement of healthcare inequalities. And we really hope that these individuals will facilitate a two-way conversation. So articulating the needs of the population, but also bringing the messaging to the population, bringing the NHS into the population as it were. And um, uh, so um, I think uh, Leslie also mentioned the um, huge work that's going on in education and training. Um, and we are working very hard on making sure that health inequalities is everybody's business. So we're working with the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges to make sure that undergraduate and postgraduate health professionals are trained in how to address healthcare inequalities. We know from all BOLAS meetings and all our networks and all the trainees that come and want to work with us, there's so much enthusiasm and people are just looking for some instructions on what to do. And I really believe the nice resources are the the instruction manual that we've been waiting for. We've got modules on the eLearning for Health website and we've got modules on RCGP um, and we are having more and more are being uploaded every day and um, I'd like to draw your attention to some of our webinars. So we have webinars focusing on each of the areas of Core 20 plus 5 available on our, web, our website. Um, I, I mentioned about we're using the data that we have available to really articulate the scale of the problem, but also to drive change and to measure change. And um, we all know that the Health Quality Improvement Partnership, HQIP, underpin all their audits and all their reports with NICE guidance. So they measure everything against NICE guidance. And we worked with um, NCPOD, which is the National Confidential Inquiry into Patient Outcome and Death. So it's um, uh, under the umbrella of HQIP. Um, we worked with them to do a thematic review of all their existing data and to see were health inequalities an issue or not when it came to adverse outcomes, experiences and even death. And I'm sure you all instinctively know, but I'm very sad to say that it was a theme that ran throughout everything. Uh, we had, you know, really stark inequalities, especially experienced by children and young people or elderly people or people who are using alcohol. Um, and we saw a real intense rural inequality as well. I think this report is really important reading for anybody interested in addressing healthcare inequalities. We've worked with the National Clinical Audit Programme as well. Qualities and data is consistent across all national clinical audits. So we brought all the national clinical audit leads together with our colleagues from NICE and, Health in and NHS England. Um, and we agreed an approach both to the data collection, data and then the recommendations building that addressed healthcare inequalities. Um, and this was a really good example of collaborative working and ownership of the work by the clinical audit leads with support from NICE and NHS England. And this is work that is continuing on. Um, and so there's a commitment to improving the data, to doing an annual review and to really um, em embrace an intersectional approach to looking at healthcare inequalities in the national clinical audits. So I mentioned uh, that you might want to get involved or read some of our reports or find out more what, about what we're doing, what's new and see some case studies and maybe even contribute some case studies. So I'd really invite you to have a look at our Health Inequalities Futures platform. And um, finally, I'm going to plug our conference, which NICE will be joining us at as well. Um, and so uh, this conference, this is the third time we've tried to have it. It was cancelled twice already. So I really I think it's third time lucky, the 11th of January. And it's a full day looking at all the areas of Core 20 plus 5 and then looking at how all the national bodies can support ICSs to tackle healthcare inequalities. And then we're having some deep dive workshops into the, into the individual clinical areas of Core 20 plus 5. So hopefully see some of you there. Thank you very much. Back to you, Deb. 
Thanks, Eva. That was a great presentation. We had earlier on uh, a question about how NICE and NHS England are working together to support ICBs uh, with tackling health inequalities. I think you've probably covered quite a lot of that there. But I am going to invite colleagues back to the panel now so that we can answer a few of the questions that have arisen. Thanks very much. OK, I'm going to go to Leslie first, if that's OK. Uh, in a time of financial pressure, for everyone. Um, how can following NICE guidance help generate bang for buck in health inequalities? And I was wondering, Leslie, if that might be something that you would comment on. Um, I'm happy to have make a start. Um, it's quite a big question and I think there are probably lots of other considerations that I would want to put in place. Um, but from um, my involvement in the development of guidelines, in the involvement of economic analyses, I would say that I, I would suggest that implementing any of NICE's guidelines and products represents bangs per buck for the system. Because when we're looking at evidence, we're looking at evidence of effectiveness and we're looking at evidence of cost effectiveness. So a committee wouldn't be recommending something unless it was considered to be good value for money for the system. Um, and so I would argue that actually implementation of any of NICE guidelines represents good value for money and it's a bang, a good bang for the buck. Thanks, Leslie. Jo, I wasn't sure you mentioned NICE quality standards in your presentation. Would you add anything um, about how NICE quality standards can help ensure bang for buck? Yeah, and I think um, the way the statements are pulled out from the, the guideline is really that prioritised list where the most improvement uh, can be gained. And I think it, addressing that, what we know to be variations um, in care and practice, that does help as well in terms of um, in the limited resource and trying to get value for money, the consistency in that approach and that real drive for quality improvement. Thanks, Jo. Um, we've had lots of positive feedback about the presentations. And um, I'd just like to let people know there is a link at the bottom to provide any more feedback. Um, it, it would be really useful in helping us to shape future presentations. Um, the questions keep skipping around on my screen, but one of them is um, positive feedback, great presentations. In terms of collaborating to reduce health inequalities, how important is it that we get to a point where everyone working in healthcare understands they have a role to play? And I was wondering, perhaps, Aoife, if you would comment on that, and then maybe if Jane and Sally Ann. So, how important is it to make sure that everyone working in healthcare understands that they have a role to play? Thank you very much. I, I think this is a tricky challenge and one that we agonize over a lot. I think it's very important for people to understand uh, the role that they have in addressing health care inequalities, but also to understand that we're not asking the world of people because we know that the healthcare system and uh, everybody who's working really hard in it, we know they're already overwhelmed and under huge pressure. So we don't want health inequalities to feel like this unreachable extra demand. We want it to be almost a change in thinking. So um, we want people to maybe, you know, signpost somebody in, in a holistic way or use a sort of make every contact count approach where if they're checking the um, blood pressure, they might say, have you thought about giving up smoking? Or, um, you know, when we, we know that there's lots of amazing initiatives, as we heard already with the flu vaccine, um, but also with um, the COVID vaccines, if we can kind of link up the services to address health inequalities holistically. I think a huge part of it is integrated working. And I think the case study from Nottinghamshire really showed that, that it's not 
the front door clinicians, let's say, who, who are going to be able to address all of healthcare inequalities, they may merely be able to identify people at risk of health inequalities or experiencing health inequalities, and then perhaps signpost them on or link them up or make sure that there's a holistic approach. And um, I think, you know, in the NHS, we're really addressing healthcare inequalities. That's very much the sort of downstream effects of societal inequalities. Um, but working with ICBs and public health and OHID um, and uh, UKHSA um, to, to really address those broader determinants of health, I think is, is, is where we're going to be able to make a difference. I don't think any clinician or, or manager can do this on their own and I don't think the NHS can do it all on its own. Um, so yeah, it's definitely good timing with the new ICBs. Thanks, Eva. Jane and Sally Ann, did you have anything to add? I, I think, from a public health perspective, what I would add is a couple of things to that. One is that we need to accept that the care and, and support that we provide has the ability to increase inequality as well as decrease it. So we need to recognise that. The other thing that I would say is it needs to come top down as well as bottom up. So we need all of our workers to understand the role that they've got in, in addressing health inequalities, but we need to have strategic buy-in from our senior leaders across, not just nationally, but local system level. So in, in our integrated care system, we've got a really clear ambition around health inequalities and what we're going to do to reduce that. We've also got a real sort of interest in anchor institutions. So this whole idea that a big organisation like us who employ a lot of people have an ability to make a huge difference to local communities in what we do. So not just about healthcare, but that wider kind of offer around employment, around opportunity. So I think that that's what we, what we really need to capitalise on now. But I've been around a long time and I have to say that I think now is the, the best time I've seen for a long time in terms of that strategic buy-in that we can do something different around health inequalities. And that even the level of data so the data we have to be able to show equity of access equity of outcome we have to be able to demonstrate things where, where we're baselining from and that we're really bringing around change i think when people see that tangible change that's when they buy in sometimes as well so it, it's kind of a a multi a, a multifaceted approach but certainly strategic buy-in at the very top i think has, has been really important to us here in nottinghamshire thanks jane um, one of the things, Jane and sally that you've talked about is um, how you've involved people with lived experience. And uh, this is actually a question for Leslie, if that's OK. Um, you mentioned during your presentation um, that the opportunities for patients and the public, people with lived experience, to get involved in guideline development. But we were wondering if perhaps you could just give us a little bit more information. Yes, um, we have a team at NICE and that's their primary responsibility to get input from patient groups, from the public, from the charitable sector, from the voluntary sector. Um, and they have lots of um, approaches that they can adopt to, us, to secure this engagement, which can include having targeted focus groups with key population groups that might be impacted by a guideline, which is what happened with the guideline that was being developed for people experiencing homelessness. Um, and the way that this happens um, to ensure that we have adequate representation throughout the process, the team um, work with different sectors um, and we will have at least two lay members on a committee who have equal standing to other committee members so they are able to make decisions based on the evidence that they've seen. Um, the team work very closely with national charities and voluntary organisations. They can identify and nominate experts. They can provide written submissions and they can comment on the draft recommendations too. Um, they also work with um, patient experts, individual patients or carers, um, and they can participate in committee meetings. Um, they might give expert testimony, they can provide written submissions, and similarly, they can comment on the draft recommendations. And the public now are able to observe committee meetings or some committee meetings. And 
if they are if they have representation on relevant groups they can also comment on the draft recommendations so there are lots of ways in which um, we can ensure that we have um, input from relevant stakeholders in the development of the guideline and the, the the implementation team the public involvement team work very closely with us to ensure that that happens thank you leslie um we're coming up to the end of the session i'm just going to with one very quick question for Eva, if that's okay uh leslie talked about the training that we are providing internally for colleagues at nice to ensure that they're equipped with the skills necessary to properly consider equalities and health inequalities. There has been a question about whether there are plans to offer training to people working uh, in health inequalities and um, to spread throughout their organisation. So this is more about whether it's going to be training in the health and care system. I was just wondering if you had anything that you'd quickly like to add about how people can access that from NHS England. As I said, our products are constantly in development. So, you know, we do have some training material already available um, and more in the pipeline. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the ORCGP modules. And um, so they're free to access for anybody. You don't have to be a member of the Royal College of General Practitioners. And um, you just have to make a, an account online with your email address. Um, and then the e-learning for health modules are also open and free for all to access. Um, and we're doing the e-learning for health modules um, in a sort of a gradual way. So we've actually focused on sickle cell because we know that is a really national priority, mainly because of the huge inequalities experienced by people with sickle cell cell disease. Um, so um, there are modules on that and there are modules in development on each of our five key clinical areas. Um, but as I said, we are working with the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges and Health Education England. And what we're trying to do is develop a training program that's not exclusive for doctors or dentists or physiotherapists or, or even patients or lay people. We're, we're trying to build a sort of a core shared content. Um, but actually those plans are kind of on pause because because we've seen the nice materials uh, so yeah I think it'll be about how we sort of put them into practice and you know how we skill people up in using the resources like that rather than a finite curriculum great and of course Eva, once they're ready and finalized we'll be updating our nice web pages to ensure that we're signposting to them and I'm sure that Jane, uh, you'd probably want me to flag the OHID resources as well, um, the Health Matters resources that are available on um, the e-learning modules on health inequalities too. So the NICE Health Inequalities web pages, their early days are a work in progress and we will be signposting to partners resources as soon as we can we'll continue to develop them. So please do feedback to us what you found helpful, what you would like to see more of, and we will respond as quickly as we can. But that brings us to the close of this event. Thank you again to our speakers, our contributors, our panelists, and indeed you, our audience. We hope you found this useful. Uh, remember, you can access the web resource uh, from the link on this platform, and we'd also welcome your feedback. Um, but that's it for now. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>